Good morning, party people, and welcome to office hours in the backyard. I was uh, so nice in the summer here in Vegas because the sun comes up at like 5.30 a.m. and it's still nice enough in the mornings that I just got back from walking the dog around the neighborhood. Uh, and it was so nice out here that I was like, oh, you know what? I should film a little office hours video. Um, I, uh, we redid the backyard and did it in kind of a Barbie pink theme because my partner's really into the, the Barbie pink thing. Um, but it's uh, just a nice place to be in the mornings. Usually I'll sit out here and have my coffee, although usually I'm not looking at you. Usually I'm looking in the other direction. So let's see here. What are your top voted questions? Number one is from My Tea Got Cold, who's asked a bunch of questions lately, and nothing wrong with that. My Tea Got Cold asks, when you're going into a database blind, do you worry at all about its compatibility level? I see a lot of unloved databases that are at 2008's level, but the tiny potential for breaking changes makes me scared to touch it. Go Google Brent Ozar How to Go Live on SQL Server 2022. And I really need to rename that post to make it easier for people to find. But the short story is, why would you change compatibility level if you don't have the time to do query tuning? Because what happens is the, the queries, when you change at different compatibility levels, some queries will suddenly be faster, some queries will suddenly be slower, and it's going to be a change for your users. Even if it's only a handful of queries that suddenly go slower, that can be problematic. So leave that setting where it is. Don't touch it until you have a really good reason to touch it. Next up, Vishnu asks, for boxed SQL Server, is it okay for users to create SQL agent jobs that do things like business logic or email end users? Vishnu, that's really a political question. It's really up to your company, right? What do they want to let your users do? What do they not let you want your let, let the end users to do? Here's the thing that I would gen generally tell uh, companies. If you let users create and change agent jobs, those agent jobs won't be there when we go to fail over to another place, like we fail over to our disaster recovery data center. Oh, got a little bug coming around here. So if they're okay with that, or if they want to let the end users manage that, that's fine, but that's something they're going to have to manage. That's not something that I'm going to do as a database administrator. I can't. Next up, Karthik says, what's your opinion of SQL Sentry Plan Explorer? There's nothing wrong with it. The problem was is that SQL Sentry was acquired by a much larger company, SolarWinds, and then they never did anything. As far as I understand, the, uh, all the team that was involved with that application kind of dispersed or went to other companies. So I don't think there's many improvements in it, and I, I would kind of guess that it's like a dead man walking there. Next up, Jessica asks, I'm a database administrator who previously managed dozens of VMs. After a layoff and a new job, I'm now managing just one Azure SQL DB. Any tips for making a transition like this? Every day I'm finding features that I have no longer have access to. Yeah, what, what you want to do now is anytime you go from a bunch of servers down to just one, and any time that that one server's high availability and disaster recovery is managed by someone else, you want to ask your manager, what are you paying me to do? What are the pain points that you need me to solve? And it's probably now more about performance and developer support than it's ever been for you before. You want to focus on helping those developers build a better application and have it respond faster rather than worrying about things like high availability and disaster recovery. Uh, next up, Hong Kong asks, when we see a non-clustered index on a table, we may or may not know why it's there, who created it, or what was needed. What's the change control process for answering those questions? So this is really two parts. One is you're saying, I have too loose of security on my database. How do I fix it? Well, you don't really need to ask me that, right? You need to lock down security 
so that less people can make changes to the production database. So that's the first part. Second part is once you've locked down changes and only a few people can access or can change indexes, how do you know why that index is there? What you do is you name the index with the JIRA issue or help desk ticket issue that caused you to create that index, like ticket underscore one, two, three, four, five underscore, so that that way when people are wondering what the index exists for, they can go look up that ticket number and see the reasons for that index. Next up, Kevin asks, what's the best place to go for Postgres training? I couldn't tell you what the best place to go for is. I, I don't think in the Postgres industry there's one source for training. The place that I would honestly start is the documentation. And I know it sounds cheesy, but uh, the Postgres documentation is actually really good. It's open source. It always has been. Uh, so lots of people have put work into it over the years. Not Close Enough asks, Hi Brent, I'm inheriting a 50 terabyte database. Are there any recommended articles or trainings for working with something this size? No, because they're all different. Once you get past, say, one to five terabyte, every database is different in its own unique and crazy ways. So the place to go for training is the coworkers who have been managing this database over time. Uh, the the uh, other thing that I would tell you is, is go make a list of the objects from largest to smallest. Um, you can use that with SP Blitz Index. Their mode two will let you sort by size. And over and over again, when I uh, go hit the multi-terabyte databases, the largest objects, I just ask questions, why is this here? And people have eye-opening answers like, oh, I didn't realize we had that many indexes on this table that are all duplicate and we can knock down sizes really fast. Next up, Mike says, hi, I'm migrating from SQL Server 2017 to managed instances. And on managed instances, after a restore, there's an option that gets turned on. Do I recommend that we leave it turned on? There's this old joke amongst pilots. Modern aircraft pilots like to joke that there are, airplanes are so advanced now, there are only two things in the cockpit. There's the pilot and there's a dog. It's the pilot's job to feed the dog. It's the dog's job to bite the pilot if he tries to touch anything. SQL Server needs a dog because we're in there pushing buttons and flipping switches. Hey, what would happen if I, hey, do you think I should, what would happen if I stop touching things? Leave things the way that they are until you have a compelling reason to go start pushing switches. If you find that the defaults are bad for you, go change it. But don't just randomly click buttons in an attempt because you know better than what Microsoft does. Fair enough. Uh, next up, Venkat says, what's the most common detrimental complacency? The most common detrimental complacency you see with SQL DBAs? I've never thought about that before. Detrimental complacency. I, I think really just complacency by itself is kind of detrimental, right? People believe, oh, things are going to be fine, things are working, um, when in reality, I'll, I'll just often go in and ask DBAs, okay, so how do you know your backups are working? How do you know you don't have corruption? And they're overconfident because they become complacent. And as soon as we start looking at those fundamentals, they're not working the way they thought they did. Next up, Mattia asks, can one big analytical query that does a whole bunch of reads give SQL Server plan cache amnesia? No, SQL Server's pretty good at controlling queries that do large number of logical reads and won't flush the buffer pool cache for just one query for that. You can have it happen when queries want large memory grants, and I talk about that in my Mastering Server Tuning class. Uh, but yeah, in terms of just one standoff query, doing a lot of reads, that's not an issue. Uh, next up, Nickleton asks a really tough question. Is it possible to forward select queries 
to an availability secondary replica without changing application side? No, because the thing is, you don't really know what's just a select query. And you're like, well, hold on, Brent, of course I do. If it starts with the word select, nah, keep reading. You can have select into, for example, you can have selects that trigger writes. For example, if someone's doing auditing on everything that was selected, that can trigger writes somewhere. So I wish the SQL Server would parse the queries and try to understand whether or not they had any byproducts. Begin Tran is another one. Begin Tran Select. Who knows what they're going to do after in the next steps that they take. It's really up to you to connect to a secondary replica. The, if you really wanted to be ambitious and, and uh, automatically move some queries to a secondary, what you want to do is put some kind of load balancer in front of SQL Server so that when a connection is made to SQL Server, the load balancer says, right, you're this user, you're going over to this replica instead, but it's nothing that's built into SQL Server. And we'll do one more. Uh, WBDBA says, my friend suggests creating all indexes on a test database since it mirrors the production database. Is this a good approach? Is it a good approach for what? What's the problem that you're trying to solve? You wouldn't believe how often that comes up as an answer when I get questions from clients, from training students, from the public. They're like, hey, I'm thinking about duct taping these two together. What do you think? What's the problem that you're trying to solve? That, will st that one thing right there will help you so much in your career. Focus on solving problems. Find out what it is that the user's trying to accomplish. And this happens to me with query tuning. Users will come to me with a query and they'll say, all right, I'm having this problem. This query runs for 30 minutes and I'll look at the query and I'll recoil in horror and I'll go, wait a minute. Okay, let's take a step back. What's the business process that you need this query for? What's the business problem that you're trying to solve? And sometimes just by asking that, I can get them to say, oh, well, you know what? The, the data that you really need is already over in this other table. It's already over in this other report. It's already over in the data warehouse for you. But people get so focused in on, they forget that they, their job is to solve business problems. It's not to get rat hole down to one really tiny technical solution. All right, so there's a good bunch of questions for today's office hours. Next, I need to power wash this deck. I've had this deck, we redid the deck with pink and white squares, and I haven't power washed it since we put it in. It's starting to look kind of grungy. And uh, it's such a nice morning out. I think I'm going to do that before I go start work. Today I have to go follow up with a client. We work together for my two-day SQL critical care and uh, clients these days, I've added on a free four-hour follow-up call where we get back together a week or two later. And this way, I can actually see, are you doing your homework? Are you doing the things that you needed to do to get this SQL Server past its pain points? See, there we go with the pain points again. And the reason why I did that is why I found out very quickly after I'd done a couple of them that some teams do a great job on their homework some teams do a really crappy job on their homework inside the same company. Some teams will do a great job. Some teams won't have the time to get their homework done. And then so I can sit back with management and go, okay, so now remember, if you don't do this work, things aren't going to get better. If that team, let's say, for example, with the team that I'm dealing with today, it's a really large legacy application. They have a lot of queries they need to fix, but I gave them a prioritized list. And I said, here's what you need to do to see relief. If after two weeks, this team hasn't done that work, then I can say to management, all right, looks like we're gonna have to throw hardware at this problem instead. Here's the kind of hardware that you would have to throw at it if that team won't make progress on those queries. Or, on the other hand, if it turns out that this team is rock stars at knocking down these queries that they know they needed to change, 
I'm going to give you a hilarious example because you're probably asking like, all right, what kind of, what do you mean by changing queries? There's a table that stores past session data and it's supposed to only have 30 days worth of history in it. And so every five minutes, a query runs and loops through all the old session data and is supposed to delete it. The delete query had a bug and it wasn't actually deleting any old rows. So this table had gotten staggeringly large and every five minutes, this loop query was looping through all the rows in it. This looping query to delete data that wasn't actually deleting anything was running continuously on this SQL server using up three CPU cores 24 seven. I'm like, okay, guys, this is a really easy fix. Here's the bug. Here's what someone should have caught this. They didn't catch it. That's okay. But we need to start deleting this data. Here's how you're going to delete it. This should be a 15 minute fix. We'll find out on the call whether it was or not. Kind of goofy how everybody out there who's watching this is like, that could never possibly happen to me. Do you think dumb people call me? Generally speaking, my customers are pretty smart and yet this stuff still goes unnoticed. So man, if I could give you one piece of consulting advice, one piece of SQL Server tuning advice, know what your largest tables are and know what your most resource intensive queries are. Those two things will take you a really long way. Know your, I'm hiccuping over here. Know your largest tables and know your most resource intensive queries. You do those two things, you'll be able to knock out a huge amount of load on the server. All right, well, time to get my power washing on. Hope y'all had fun. Adios, and I will see you on the next office hours. Later.